Okay, welcome back. Uh, we're just having a little bit of a chill relaxation uh, conversation. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, all right. Cool. Uh, I hope you had a good break. Uh, all right, so we've been discussing about uh, uh, the beauty of the Lord, the holiness in the beauty of the Lord. Um, and so how beauty of the Lord is the manifest expression of his holiness. His glory is the manifest expression of his holiness. Uh, and we saw quite extensively uh, from Psalm 90, verse 16 and 17, from which perspective Moses is writing the psalm, uh, saying, let the, let the light of your face shine upon your people. Why? So when your face shines, he understood that there is life and the favor is there. And so, you know, let it uh, reflect on us, basically is what it is isn't it um kind of like moon moon you know <laughs> takes all the uh, you know just absorbs the light and everything from the sun and it then reflects onto us in the night isn't it um yeah how many of you all know superman yeah <laughs> uh, uh, where, where, where does he get the strength from? <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the scene where he goes up and then he absorbs the sun? Uh, you know, the sunlight, I should say. Uh, and then uh, he gains strength and, uh, and whatnot. So, okay. As we were. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so in the next section talks about worship in the beauty of his holiness. Um, this is where the we get that line from, isn't it? From Psalm 29, verse 2. The very key scriptures that I would appreciate if we could just memorize these scriptures. It's not enough. It's it's okay that we know that okay, the scripture says, uh, you know, the Bible says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. And I think this is one of the words that we have to remember. Psalm 29, verse 2, Psalm 96, verse 9. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Again, the Hebrew word used there is hadar. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Right? Uh, magnificence, glory, honor, splendor, excellency, ornament. Uh, you know, lavish him. Um, if there's anything that is that uh, that we worship him from outside of holiness is not accepted or it's rejected, isn't it? Because uh, see, now that we understood that everything about God is holy, and he, his, if holiness adorns his house, and I think he's made one point very clear: I am holy. If you're, if you're going to approach me, you better approach me in holiness. If you're going to worship me, you know, worship me in holiness. That is set apart. Only then it is acceptable to me, isn't it? So true worship takes place in holiness. Okay, true worship takes place in holiness, uh, in the beauty of His holiness. Uh, is there any other scripture that you're reminded of immediately? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it's there. I can see it. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming, Anand. Come on. True worship. True worship. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I'm giving you the, I have to write on the board also. It's like, I'm giving you the clue. Okay. Oh, so uh, those who worship him. So, Father is seeking. So, yeah. So, you see, what is interesting there is that he is not seeking, he's not just seeking true worship. He's seeking true worshipers because he knows that if he finds those who are true in their worship, that their worship will also be true. Okay. Those who are true, are right, true worshippers, right? Those who are true in worship, it's like a circle. Those who are true in their worship, their worship will be true. So, Father is seeking true worshippers, right? And then it says, so that's what the line here says true worship takes place in holiness. And so, in other words, Father is seeking holy people who know that they are set apart. Who will worship me in holiness? And suddenly, there's a different perspective, isn't it, uh, about about worship and true worship, right? Because 
Uh, no, again, on the topic on, or on the subject of worship itself, the next section says that worship, which is the adoration of his beauty. So true worshipers, when they worship truly, what are they doing? They are adoring his beauty. Adoration is a beautiful word, right? Adoring someone. Oh, come, let us. Uh, yeah. Adore him, right? Uh, it's uh, when we sing that during Christmas time. Uh, we, okay, you know we think of the shepherds and everyone around the, you know, around Jesus, the baby, and then eventually the wise men coming and adoring him, lavishing him with their gifts. Um, you know, it's that's what that's what to worship is is just adoring him uh, in his beauty, in his holiness. Uh, our, our eyes are constantly fixed on him. And that's what adoration is. It's it's just so simple. It's so beautiful. If you understand, if you get just get a glimpse of the word adoration in our worship, it's so simple. It's simply leaving out all the complexities uh, of you know, and just fixing our eyes on him. That's all it is. That that is the secret to what do I say? <laughs> I don't want to say a successful life, but it's a secret to just living a holy life, I should say. Yeah, satisfied beyond satisfaction is like living a life of beyond satisfaction is like you are fulfilled, right? You feel fulfilled. It's like ah, content, abundant, yeah. Second Chronicles 20, verse 21. Uh, do you, I'm sure you remember this chapter from uh, from praise and worship, where it talks about King Jehoshaphat, right? That's the chapter. Uh, this is where we get the Second Chronicles twenty twenty one. It says, and when he had consulted with people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, and who should praise the beauty of holiness. Wow. Praise the beauty of holiness. Uh, Psalm 27 was for uh, such a well-known passage. One thing I have desired of the Lord. One thing that will I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty. Not to do anything. Uh, not to be busy with ministry. Uh, not to, this is David writing this, isn't it? Not to be a king of Israel. Uh, you know, I want, I want to come to a place where I can find myself and I can find myself only in you. And I want to be found in your house. I want to dwell where you dwell. Why? So that I can gaze upon your beauty for all the days of my life. And it starts off by saying one thing. You see how adoration is related to the one thing and how one thing is related to adoration is if is when you're saying that lord i make you my one thing really truly are you making god your one thing your only thing or is it one of the things well, one of the things i have desired <laughs> You see, just an off can you know make it sound so different, right? One of the things that I desire <laughs> that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. No, it's 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 one thing, and uh, and God commands that, not not demanding, but you know, it's, it's He commands it. Right? What's the difference between commanding and demanding? What's the difference between someone commanding respect and demanding respect? So what is the difference with you just said between us and this? No, so someone commands respect, for example. Let's say um, so the way I look at it is, is um, a person who commands respect, if, if they walked into the room, uh, they don't have to say anything. We would stand up and honor that person, right? Because we acknowledge and recognize that, okay, that person commands respect. Of their character, of their integrity, of of their personality. 
yes they command respect and then there are those who can demand respect who are not uh, not good yeah you know like, hey don't you know who i am uh, is this how you do, do you have to stand and talk to me when you're talking to me yeah so uh, why didn't you address me by reverend phd doctor uh, bishop so and so you get what i'm saying right okay so the god is he is commanding here right he's saying okay i want you to know who i am and because you know who i i am i want you to treat me you know with you know worship me and adore me and honor me with in holiness right so worship is our adoration is our admiration uh, being enthralled by his beauty and his beauty alone which is his holiness um and i and i genuinely pray that we will we will have eyes to see the wonderful connection between holiness of god and his beauty um because his holiness is seen in his beauty is nothing like it uh you know and and i love that song you know like you're beautiful as we say uh you know um i see your face in every sunrise creation the colors of the morning are in your eyes uh, some people might get offended is like what is the color of the morning in the eyes and you know, what do you mean by that uh, you know sometimes we need to let songwriters be songwriters uh, artists be artists and not get too complicated about it but then see how beautifully they reveal things to us isn't it and and i know that your eyes are like flames of fire i know that your head is white as wool i know that your voice it sounds like waters jesus you're beautiful so you see it, it's that's taken everything is written over there is from revelation chapter 1 right his head was as white as wool his eyes was like blazing fire his feet was like bronze and that somehow all of that is related to beauty right it's not like oh, like, oh his eyes are so fire let me run away you see the this is what the kingdom life is all about is uh <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, right? It's, his eyes are like, you know, blazing fire. His head is white as wool. Uh, you know, and your voice sounds like many waters, like thundering waters. Um, and Jesus, you're beautiful. Right? Uh, and so adoration in worship and worshiping him in the beauty of his holiness uh, is awesome. That's all I can say. It takes it takes us to a different realm, uh, you know, of or a place in God uh, that you will begin to love it, and you will want to stay there, and He will love you. And then you realize Psalm thirty four is happening. Those who look on Him and their faces were radiant. It says those who they looked on Him and their faces were radiant. That means the glory of His face was now reflecting on them, and now even they are radiant. Are you all following? All right. So worship, uh, and also let's just uh, one more key subject uh, topic here is worship with uh, reverence or revelry. Reverence or revelry. Uh, Psalm 15, verse 1 and 5, uh, it says towards the end, uh, in verse 1, who may dwell in your holy hill, or who may stand in his holy place. This is question, right? Uh, and we shall be satisfied with your goodness, uh, Psalm 65, verse 4. We shall be satisfied, satisfied, Anand, with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. Okay, so what does that entire verse say? Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts, in your holy place, in your holy hill. We shall be satisfied with goodness of your house, of your holy holy temple and so you know there is this place where we you know we've learned about the seven hebrew words of in, in praise like maybe shabakh and and uh, barak and, and whatnot halal and yada and toda you know we praise exuberantly right and all of that you know or different postures of praise uh, uh tahila uh, you know or different postures of praise in all of that we have to keep in mind that we are doing it for him and to him. We are doing it out of reverence, right? We celebrate 
uh, in reverence. We, we shout for joy in reverence because uh, he's our king of all kings. Right? Shout, it says, isn't it? Uh, for the king is in our midst. Right? And not just to uh, another, what do I say? We don't just do it out of revelry. Okay, it's like, okay, let's have a party. Let's enjoy, you know, good music and jump around where there is no reverence. Are you, are you following? Okay. Uh, so time and time again, in this scriptures that we just read, Psalm 15, verse 1 to 5, Psalm 24, you know, it talks about holy hill, uh, holy place, holy temple. Right? It talks about his dwelling place. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I may seek, that I may dwell. Okay. And then we look at this section in Isaiah 57, verse 15. Isaiah 57, verse 15. Um, it says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. And he says, I will dwell in the high and holy place. Okay, stop. So where is he dwelling? In the high and holy place, right? It's like his throne room, or whatever it is you want to call it. Heaven, third heaven. But he dwells in a high and holy place, uh, right? It's a place that is set apart. Are you all with me? Right? It's his throne room. His house is holy. His uh, the holy hill, uh, the holy temple, uh, holy place. Uh, and that's where he dwells. Okay, that says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. How do we explain that? He inhabits eternity. How do you define eternity? <laughs> But anyway, that's for us to ponder about it. Uh, you can't say forever because, again, it's limited by time. <laughs> we just don't understand. We are, we kind of know what eternity means, but honestly, we don't completely uh, understand it. So that's where he dwells. And then what is interesting is what he says after the comma. With him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So it's saying this God, the high and lofty one who dwells in a holy place, with him he has a contrite and a humble ones. Broken. Yeah, brokenness. So who... Huh? No, he's talking about others. After the comma. So with him, he dwells in the high and holy place. And then along with him, the ones who have a contract and a broken heart dwell along with him. And that's simply what it is. So God dwells in the high and holy place, a place inaccessible and unreachable to ordinary people. And yet, God himself states that those who are of broken and humble spirit will dwell with him in the high and holy place. You know, it talk about we spoke about Moses in the last class. Uh, you know how we God spoke with him face to face, and talk about that intimate relationship that they shared. In Numbers twelve, uh, it begins by saying he is the most humble person. Right? In uh, Numbers twelve, uh, from verse three, it says, "Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble man than anyone else on the face of the earth." It says here. Numbers 12, verse 3. And so, again, something about humility, uh, genuine humility, not fake humility. <laughs> okay. Absolute brokenness. Um, coming before him without any masks. Um, it's something about that attracts him to us. And James chapter 4, again, uh, emphasizes that in you know, he gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. Right? You can try coming to him, but he's like, uh, no, he's resisting you. He's saying, stop. Not anymore. No, you know, no more further. But he gives grace to the humble. Right? Uh, in Proverbs 6, I think, uh, I forget which verse, but there's this long list of things that it says the Lord detests. Proverbs 6. Um, and the first on the list is haughty eyes. 
or a proud, you know, a prideful heart. That's what it is. <clears throat> yeah, it's in Proverbs somewhere. Proverbs chapter six, though. So living in brokenness and humility is key to dwelling in the high and, and holy place. In other words, now, you know, in 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 Second Corinthians, uh, it says we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, for the most part, we've used that scripture for uh, as an in for an individual purposes, like say, okay, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? So live holy, like uh, don't do unholy things with your body. But when Paul was writing, he's actually writing to a body of of, of a local community in Corinthians. He's like, hey, you, don't you guys know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? And so in other words, what he is he's saying, what happens in the temple of the Lord? He dwells. God dwells. Isn't it? In other words, he's saying, because you are the temple of the Lord, host him well. Right, learn to host his presence. Learn to host him well. And how do we learn to host him? With a humble and a contrite heart. And he is attracted to that. Right, and we, and that's why you know what what is prayer is a sign of dependency on him. Right, in prayer it's a sign of humility. It's like you're just simply saying by any prayer request, you are saying, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you. It's a sign of brokenness. It's a sign of dependency. And I, God loves that. Yes? Uh, so something about humility and brokenness that God absolutely loves. Um, he's attracted to it like, you know, this law of physics. <laughs> like he can't. He cannot ignore. It's like what goes up must come down. It's like, okay, brokenness, I have to go. If I see a broken and a contrite heart, I have to go. That is why David is such a big deal in the context of worship, even after he did everything he did. Right? Adultery, murder, lies. And then in Psalm 51, he says, Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Create in me a clean and a contrite heart. Right? Broken spirit. He will not despise. That means he will not ignore. He will come to you. Right? And I think this is something that we all need to strive for is uh, uh, in living a life of holiness and, uh, you know, in living a life of humility and brokenness, we host him well. Uh, and it's, and, you know, there's something that I learned uh, over the years is that Psalm 23 was, uh, what was five, I think. He says, He prepares a table for me. Right? He? He prepares a table. So what does that mean? Who prepares a table? Uh, the host prepares the table. Thank you. And who do you call host when you go to someone else's house? Isn't it? Right? So it's like I come to your house for dinner. I, you, you prepare the table. You're hosting me. So Psalm 23 says... He prepares a table, so that means we all know that eventually he's going to host us in his house. We only have a limited amount of time for us to host him here on earth. And we want to do it well. Yeah, we have 30, 40, 50 years. That's all. It seems like oh, 50 years. 50 years is all we have to host him because for eternity he is going to host us. Isn't that beautiful? And living life from that perspective that we have very limited time to live a holy life, uh, you know, I'm saying I live a life of brokenness and humility. Uh, you know, don't get too caught up living a life filled with pride and, you know, and all the other things. We don't have time for that, <laughs> honestly, right? You don't have time. Uh, are you all following? Yes? Uh, is something making sense? 
Okay. All right. So humility, uh, the key to dwelling with, with the Holy One. Uh, and then Psalm 110, going to the next section, talks about volunteers clothed with the beauty of holiness. Volunteers were clothed with the beauty of holiness. So who are these volunteers now? Uh, <laughs> you guys. So Psalm 110, verse 1 to 3, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauty of holiness. From the womb of the morning, you have dew of your youth. Okay, so what is this interesting psalm? Is, uh, it's, a, it's a very prophetic psalm of the millennial reign of the Lord. Okay, it's a prophetic psalm of God's millennial reign here on earth okay you know we're not going to go deep into eschatology okay or uh, end times in uh, revelation and daniel uh, but it's been quoted by jesus in matthew 22 44 and then you look you can look at acts chapter 2 verse 35 and there's a lot of scripture that's mentioned there so what it's saying is okay so who do you call a volunteer who do you call a volunteers who willingly comes yeah who willingly comes to serve okay uh there's one interesting thing uh i forget which version of the bible but in jo judges chapter 5 it says uh in the nrsv version if you if some, does someone have like a bible app uh that looks you can go to in the nrsv version judges chapter 5 Uh, I have to see the. Just give me a second. <clears throat> I have to use my an RSV. Give me a second, guys. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I love that version. Okay, so I'm going to read first the NKJV version, and then we look at the NRSV version. Okay, and uh, and I just want to see the just do, do a comparison. So Judges chapter five verse two says, "When the leaders led in Israel, and when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord." What is it saying? Willingly offer themselves. In other words. Okay, so. Uh, that's the NRSV version, which is when the locks were long in Israel. What does that mean when the locks were long in Israel? So if you just study just a little bit further of just on that verse, it's talking about the Nazarites. <laughs> the bulb is going off now, isn't it? Oh, yeah, long hair, long locks, you know. So it's just saying Nazarites were so radical, like they just gave themselves because they were so passionate about God and so filled with zealous uh, for him, for his holiness. And that's why Nazarites were simply uh, those who were radically set apart. Judges chapter 5, verse 2. Right? I just love the NRSV version of that. It says, when the locks were long in Israel. And then in, uh, in another translation, it says, when the leaders led in Israel. And they gave willingly. So they are volunteers who led in this radical holiness. And then now we see in the notes, in the same scripture, uh, as in, in Psalm 110, now the people shall be volunteers in the day of your power who willingly gave themselves to you uh, in the beauty of holiness. That means when they gave themselves to the Lord, God wrapped them or wraps them in his holiness. Are you following what I'm saying? Okay, so this passage just tells us that what kind of volunteers we, his people, should uh, be as we so simply, uh, as we willingly give ourselves, uh, you know, we are clothed in the beauty of holiness. Okay, are you all with me? Okay, um, let's move on. Everyone who has this hope walks. Holy. 
everyone who has this hope walks holy what hope let's look at Titus chapter 2 verse 11 and 14 um, uh, are we all on the same page guys yes yeah it's in the notes guys by the way so uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 11 and 14 it says for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men it's talking about Jesus teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great god and savior jesus christ what is he, what what is that in, in telling there verse 13 what is it looking for a blessed hope what is the blessed hope jesus is returned that's what i say okay so looking for the blessed hope now he said okay in verse 11, he's uh, saying, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That means Jesus appeared to all men. It says that. Okay. And then teaching us that denying ungodliness and all of that. And verse 13, and now all of that has happened. We are looking for the blessed hope. We are awaiting the Lord's return. Okay. So awaiting the Lord's return is, uh, is written as the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 to 3, it says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Okay, so we're talking about the return of the Lord here. His second coming. Do you believe that, no? So, okay, let's ask this. Uh, let me po post a question. Uh, when we talk about the return of the Lord or the second coming, um, what does that make you think? Or how does it make you respond to that? So, do you, do you believe Jesus is coming back? Believe Jesus is coming back? Sure, no? Okay, 100%. Okay, okay. So, what, um, what does that do to you? Does it, does it cause you to live life a certain way? What are all the things that uh, makes you know it makes you think or do when you know that Jesus is coming back? What are some of the things? Sorry, we'll be with him. Okay, so when Jesus comes back, we'll be with him. That's what he thinks. Okay, be ready to go with okay, pack suitcase, everything ready. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, which, where in the scriptures does it say to be prepared? Luke? Matthew, where? Luke 24? Luke 24, that is the Ascension chapter. Uh, okay. <laughs> ten virgins. Uh, ten, yeah. So, which are Matthew 25? Matthew 25, I think. Yeah. So uh, Matthew chapter ten, uh, uh, sorry, chapter twenty-five, where it talks about the parable of the ten uh, virgins, right? It says, "Be prepared." In other words, uh, telling us to live a life of holiness. Okay, be prepared. Okay, have an intimate relationship with Him. Uh, don't you know live a hasty life? Um, and so that's one of the things. The other, the second thing is very missional. It should cause a sense of urgency in us for us to spread the gospel. Uh, do, you know, to fulfill the commission of the Lord, as it says in Matthew chapter twenty-eight, isn't it? But one of the one of the components of His return is that we are expected to live a life uh, life of holiness, a righteous life, right? until we see Him face to face, as it says in First John chapter three. Okay, so everyone who has this hope walks holy, right? We uh, in, in I think Hebrews chapter twelve. It's uh, now now that we are surrounded with a great cloud of witness. Run this race with perseverance, endurance. 
Okay, now that we have a great cloud of witness, run this race with endu endurance and perseverance until we finish that race, until we go home to be with Him. Right? We are called to let go of all ungodliness, let go of everything. So everyone who has this hope walks holy or lives a holy life. Okay, and then finally, in that day, a reign of holiness. So in that day, what is that day? Let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8 to 10. Can someone uh, read that, please, from the notes? Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8 to 10. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8 to 10. A highway shall be there, and a road. And it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any raven's beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrows and shigging shall flee away. Sorry, sorry. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Sorrow and sigh means uh, it's like a deep sorrow and sigh. You know, he, he breathed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Prince. So that's Isaiah again. He's prophesying about the millennial reign. Okay, and you you learn more about this in eschatology. Uh, but th this is just with looking at it. Uh, for one perspective, let's look at another scripture, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 20 and 21, please. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bills of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day, there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Okay, thank you. So again, he's prophesying about the millennial reign. Uh, it's just the emphasis on the holiness by both Isaiah and Zechariah. It's saying, okay, during the reign of the Lord, the roads will be <laughs> marked with holiness, that only the redeemed uh, you know who who've who've been marked with holiness will be allowed to pass through to enter Zion. Uh, following uh, the ungodly will not be permitted. It's like no visa. And then it goes on to say that every little thing in that reign will be marked with holiness, as Zechariah says. Even the bells of horses. For me, it was like there's going to be horses. The millennial reign, that's what I, you know, one big so cool. But you see that everything, every little thing will be marked as holy to the Lord, holy unto the Lord, or holiness to the Lord. That means set apart. Everything will be marked with holiness. Right. I was uh, seeing a, a lecture very recently. It's one of those lectures I was listening to in my sleep, and I don't even know where the lecture is or who was actually talking about it. Um, it's, it was about the study of eschatology and whatnot. So this is, and it's very vague, guys. So they were having a discussion about why, uh, why, do, why should there be a thousand-year reign, like a millennial reign, and then you know the judgment. W what's that about? You know. So um, I was hearing this person say, you know, I think that was just to show how it would have been, how life would have been if Adam, Adam had not fallen. You know, and so if, if sin had not entered, how life would have been, it would have been marked with holiness and set apart and, and, and you know, absolute beauty. Um, and, and so that's what that millennial reign is all about, is to show that what life on earth, that's what it says, right? A new heaven, a new earth, right? What it would be like if sin with, without sin, right? And so uh, that's simply there is no room for holiness, and and God takes that very seriously. 
Are you all with me? Right? Um, so that, that's, that, that concludes this chapter six. Uh, is, yeah, is the beauty of the Lord is the holiness of God manifested is, or expressed or demonstrated. And by this end of this section, we've, where we've completed six chapters, and I really hope that we've captured the seriousness that God puts uh, on holiness. Right? He is holy. He desires you to be holy. And he's also given you the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay, Prince. Yeah, I don't know what theology that is or what doctrine that is. Uh, <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions uh, or any thoughts? Those online uh, or anybody here? Any other thoughts? Any questions? Okay, then I uh, guess you have uh, understood it all. Um, I want you to go back and go through this chapter again. I'm sure there will be a lot of content that you might have or would have missed, or even if you have not missed it, I think it's always nice to revise. This one of those chapters that's really beautiful. Okay, all right, guys. Thank you all for joining. Thank you all for joining us online. Uh, Prabhu, Samuel, Nina, Ravli, Jatin, Chira. Anthony, Shiv Kumar, good to see you all. Uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, God bless you. Have a wonderful week and see you next week. See you guys. Bye.